Modern man is faced with a large number of threats. One of these threats is very likely to affect many of us, and it is obesity. The World Health Organization estimates that in 2016, more than 1.9 billion people were overweight, of which 650 million are obese. Obesity is a problem because it is associated with a large number of comorbidities. One of the most serious problems being diabetes mellitus type 2, DM2 for short, which causes the number of pathologies ranging from eye damage to kidney failure and heart attacks. Many people know that DM2 is associated with high blood glucose levels. But what is it exactly? Well, normally when we eat, blood glucose levels rise. This is sensed by the pancreas, which then excretes the hormone insulin. Insulin triggers predominantly the liver and skeletal muscle to take up this glucose and restore its levels in blood back to the baseline. What happens in obesity is that muscle and liver become less sensitive to insulin, a process which we call insulin resistance. This means that when blood glucose levels rise, the insulin that is normally produced is insufficient to lower blood glucose levels completely. In response, the pancreas produces more insulin. If this hyperinsulinemia is still capable of bringing back blood glucose levels to baseline, we speak of prediabetes. If this hyperinsulinemia is not able to bring back blood glucose levels to a certain threshold value, within a two-hour time period after a meal, we speak of DM2. What causes DM2? It is a multifactorial disease, but what is known is that pro-inflammatory mediators such as TNF, interferon gamma and IL-1 beta are present in higher levels in the blood of people with diabetes and that they promote insulin resistance. Prospective studies using vast number of patients have showed that the blood glucose levels gradually rise starting years to decades before diagnosis of DM2. But shortly before diagnosis, blood glucose levels steeply rise, suggesting an unknown event that triggers loss of glycemic control. We realize that viral infection causes a strong increase of pro-inflammatory mediators and may therefore be associated with this event. It is common knowledge among endocrinologists that uh, infection uh, can have an impact on blood glucose. And in our clinical practice, when a patient presents uh, with newly diagnosed diabetes type 2, especially with high blood glucose levels, with or without ketosis or ketoacidosis, we actively screen for a possible site of infection. And even though we know all that, surprisingly, there is little scientific evidence to support the fact that infection can have an impact in the development of diabetes mellitus type 2. We wanted to investigate whether infection impacts uh, regulation of systemic glycemia. Therefore, we, we initiate a human study in which we recruited non-diabetic uh, patients with acute influenza infection. Blood glucose and insulin levels were measured during the peak of infection and three months later when they had recovered from their illness. We observed that infection was associated with much higher blood insulin levels, a clear sign of insulin resistance. Blood glucose levels were not increased. Our human study implicated that viral infection causes insulin resistance, but it was too small uh, to determine whether viral infection also causes glucose intolerance, uh, which is what we actually measure to diagnose diabetes. Therefore, we decided to switch to a mouse model. We fed mice a normal, healthy diet or a diet containing high levels of animal fat. The latter diet makes animals obese and also generates a state of prediabetes. This means that they get liver insulin resistance, compensatory hyperinsulinemia, but still have mostly normal blood glucose levels. We next infected lean mice with a virus. What we observed was very similar to what we saw in humans. Animals develop muscle insulin resistance, leading to compensatory hyperinsulinemia. Blood glucose levels in these animals were still normal. 
So what happens in the muscle in response to infection? Here we see a muscle expressing high levels of insulin receptors. When a virus invades the body, some of these cells get infected. This, in turn, attracts natural killer cells, which start producing cytokines, such as interferon gamma, to clear the infection. In addition, interferon gamma drives the muscle to downregulate the insulin receptor. This means that when blood glucose levels rise, more insulin needs to be produced in order to bring glucose levels back to the baseline. What happens when we infect obese prediabetic mice? In these animals, infection also caused muscle insulin resistance and even further increase in insulin production. However, this increase was insufficient to compensate for the cumulative insulin resistance, causing these animals to develop diabetes. So what we discovered in this paper is that the uh, immune system directly targets skeletal muscle cells to downregulate insulin receptor. This event causes uh, insulin resistance, which is then compensated by higher insulin output by pancreas. However, in obesity, where uh, muscle insulin resistance in infection comes on top of pre-existing insulin resistance, this uh, overloads ability of pancreas to compensate it and results in development of diabetes mellitus type 2. Okay, so now we understood uh, how infection causes insulin resistance, but what we still didn't know is why it happened. Uh, because, at least in lean mice, we never saw that infection caused higher blood glucose levels. In fact, the only thing we observed was that infection causes increased insulin levels. And that's when we realized that uh, that's affect what the immune system tries to accomplish, not higher blood glucose levels, but higher insulin levels. This is because the effects of insulin reach beyond regulation of blood glucose levels alone. Upon binding of insulin, the insulin receptor activates the protein PA3 kinase, which is a major signaling nexus for many processes in the cell. In liver and muscle cells, PA3 kinase is responsible for increased glucose uptake. But PA3 kinase also stimulates other processes associated with growth, such as protein synthesis and cell division. In immune cells, such as CD8 T cells, key activating receptors, such as IL-2 receptor or CD28, signal over PA3 kinase to mediate their antiviral effect. So could insulin operate to stimulate the antiviral immune system? So indeed, we found that CD8 T cells express the insulin receptor and also its intracellular uh, signaling modalities. And if we stimulated these cells in our, in our petri dish in the presence of insulin, we saw that their antiviral capacity uh, was increased. So indeed, what, what infection appears to be doing is to, to increase insulin levels to boost the antiviral CD8 T cell response. To test this hypothesis, we injected mice with the basal insulin and measured the antiviral response upon infection. Indeed, mice injected with the insulin had significantly more and more potent antiviral CD8 T cells. Conversely, when the ability of mice to produce insulin was abrogated, viral infection resulted in lower numbers of antiviral CD8 T cells. Thus, infection-induced hyperinsulinemia operates to boost the antiviral CD8 T cell response. So will the study impact your clinical practice? Yeah, yeah, it might. I believe that infection is a risk factor for the development of diabetes mellitus type 2. What it means that in people with prediabetes, we should promote strategy against infection, such as vaccination against seasonal flu.